because Sticks with God is going to be our prelude. I do have a few announcements that I want to share with you real quick. Um, let me see if I can remember. Can you uh, take down the gain a little bit, if you would? I don't know anything about that stuff, right? <laughs> don't tell nobody. All right, so I've got a couple of things in the bulletin that I want you to, to uh, know about. There's a ladies' Bible study that's going. There's a prayer study that is dynamic. It started this last week, and it'll be this week. So please make sure that you show up either Monday night or Tuesday morning at 10. So Monday night at 7.30, Tuesday morning at 10. They are awesome prayer studies, and you'll really enjoy them. Um, also, we have the voting. It's the last day to vote. So uh, if you have not voted, you need to get up right now and go vote. Go down to the NPR. I'm being absolutely serious. Thank you. I'm good with that. No, unless you've done confirmation, kids can't vote. Confirmation, kids can't vote. But once you've done been confirmed, you get to vote. That means you're a member of the church. So, okay. So, uh, that's what I'm going to say. Now, who was it that went? Let's see. Carol, Alice Snell, Savannah Francis. Who else went? We're going to talk about them. <laughs> no, we're not. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that um, we will be doing the announcement tomorrow via email. If you are someone who has an email and you do not get the e-news, it's because we don't have your email. So up here on the side, on both sides, are clipboards. On it is your name, your address, your phone number, and a slot for your email. Please print. I know you've got beautiful handwriting to you, but we have a hard time reading it sometimes. So I just want to do that. If you are someone who is of the space that email is not something you like, you're not email friendly, make sure you write in the email spot, no email, and I'll make sure that someone personally calls you to let you know the outcome. We will be doing it through email so that we can kind of give you the percentages and how that worked, uh, just so that you can know it, and then if you need to, you can pass it on to family members. So that's what we're doing with the vote. Um, we also have um, the announcement today of the new pastor. So would you come on up? Make that announcement for us. Good morning. Staff Harris and I would like to introduce you to our new pastor, Reverend Intech O, and his wife, Hannah, and his three beautiful children. Abigail is in, is in second grade, Jason is in first grade, and the baby is one. Hannah is the assistant district attorney for uh, Danville, Virginia. Reverend O is 43 years old and has a master's, from Divini uh, a master's of Divinity from Emory University. He has a master's of sacred theology with an emphasis in preaching and worship from Boston University, which is the oldest United Methodist seminary in North America. He has a doctoral degree uh, from Duke Divinity School, where he presented his thesis on a direction for small groups in the United Methodist Church. Intech is currently pastoring at Roseville United Methodist Church in Danville, Virginia, where he has served the last seven years and is leading a congregation that has loved him, loved his family, and loved his ministry to come be with you. Um, Move-in day is June 28th, and he'll be in the pulpit July the 2nd. And I ask that each one of you now prayerfully determine what you will uh, personally do to help positively impact this family as they come join us in Trinity and move to the coast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marsha. As the kids are moving up, I'm just going to um, let you know that if you are a member of grief group, grief will be tomorrow. I'm struggling. I'm grieving because I'm going to leave you guys. Um, so if you are somebody who needs to struggle with that with us, please come join us 
It will be at 12 o'clock tomorrow at the Parsonage, and we will be sharing our goodbyes. So we invite you to come be a part of that. Now would you please center yourself and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as we begin in prayer. Father God, we just ask a special anointing on this congregation and on this worship today. I pray for these kids as they show us that there's no life but in Christ alone that will make it be positive and bring us where we need to be. Anoint them as they show us what that looks like. In Jesus' name, amen.
In life, we often stand behind closed and locked doors because of its danger, toils, and snares. But then you come into our presence and say, peace, be still. You show us all. Do we need to do that one more time? You show us all that you are and free us from our fear. In this place of fellowship, you help us to understand all that is meant to be in life, and you set us free. Always abide with us, Jesus, allowing thee to be in me. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all the people say amen. Our opening hymn is Breathe on the Breath of God, number 420. Please remain standing. Let us pray. God, please come and be with us as we worship you. Allow your Holy Spirit to fall. Allow us to see you in new ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all the people say amen. Please remain standing as we share together our affirmation of faith. Number 888, printed in your, bu printed in your bullet, no, on the screen. This is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised on the third day and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the 12, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and by the blood of the cross reconciles all things to God. Amen.
You may be seated. <coughs> no children. traveling music for Dave. Na 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 Okay, we have been journeying through different things to figure out who we are, who is Jesus, and does it make a difference in our lives? Does it? Good question, right? So if we know Jesus 
as the one who died on the cross and rose again, what does the resurrection mean to you? Does it have any value? Do you believe it? And because of it, do you live your life differently? So remember, Christianity is the only religion where our God did not die but rose again. Does it really make a difference in your life? It's an important question, isn't it? So today, we're going to see what happens. We're going to look at different things that block us from living what I call a resurrected relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to start by reading the scripture, because in this scripture, we see the blocks that happen. Let's read it together. While they were still talking about this, what are they talking about? Jesus is death, burial, and resurrection, right? All three of those things. And who was talking? The disciples. Who else was talking? We learned last week that there was two on the road to Emmaus. And what did they do at the very end of that story? They turned around and they go back and tell everybody. So they're talking with them. What about the women? What did the women see? <laughs> and the angels. Yeah. So while they're still talking about this, and that's what they're talking about, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. This is translated in English, and it is shalom. Say that word with me. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. Is this the only place in the scriptures that they think they see a ghost? Where else? Walking on the water. Right? Right? Yeah, walking on the water. So they're startled and frightened, thinking they're seeing a ghost. And Jesus said to them, why are you troubled and why do you doubt? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch me, pinch yourself. Seriously, pinch yourself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? You won't believe it. You touch me. You see me. I'm here. I'm talking to you. Do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. Why did he do that? Show him he was alive. If you eat something in somebody else's presence, it means that you're having fellowship with them. Okay? So he, where, where did a lot of the revelations come? In the upper room, last time you saw him, it was around the table. Ah, now you're getting, got it, okay. So he said, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him fish and he ate it. Then he said to them, this is what I told you. Say that with me. This is what I told you. <laughs> oh my goodness, if we only did everything Jesus told us. While I was still with you, that's in John 15, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Then he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, resurrection day. If you want to have some fun, go through the scripture, and every time you see three, you're going to see something amazing happen. Good, good, good. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name, in his name, Jesus' name, to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Then he says, you. Are my witnesses. Okay, we're going to talk about this. Of these things. I'm going to send you. 
what my father has promised, that's what? It's not money. It's not a big church. It's not a new Cadillac. Okay, promised you it's the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high, the Holy Spirit. Is that it? So we're going to find out about dusk dawning. What is dusk? How many of you have been to the eye doctor lately, and the older you get, the harder it is for you to drive in the, the dusk? Right? So what's dusk dawning? It's what you see after cataract surgery. You can see again, dusk dawning. Get it? Okay, so that's your sermon. Let us pray. Father God, we come today and we ask that you would open our eyes by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we're not just talking about our physical eyes, Lord. We're talking about the eyes of our heart. We ask that you would open it up so that we might fully understand what Jesus was doing in that upper room that day. That we might see that we, not, we might not be afraid, that we might not be overwhelmed and think it's too good to be true, and that we too would come to what we call a resurrection relationship with Jesus. Come and open our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for using me today. It is in Jesus' holy name that I pray, and all the people say amen. It was years ago that there was a judge who was pretty famous in Yugoslavia. And so one day he was taking a bath, realized that it was getting dusk. So he decided he'd stand up and flip on the lights. Well, when he did, the electricity shot through him. When your water is in your feet and you have electric on your hand, what happens? It's bad news. And he ends up passing out on the floor. Well, the wife hears him as he goes thud, runs into the bathroom, calls the neighbors, calls everybody, the doctor and everybody else, and they all come and they say, oh my gosh, he is dead. So they decide that they're going to send him over to Vernon, the funeral home. And when they do, they put him out on the slab and everything, and they leave him there with the sheet over him. And then about an hour later, he wakes up. By then, it is no longer dusk. It is dark. And the night watchman is in the building. So he gets up, and he goes, and he says to the night watchman, Hi, what am I doing here? And the night watchman goes, and he runs out the door. I don't know if that's ever happened to anybody. You think somebody's dead and they're not dead. Well, here you go. So he decides, well, gosh, that didn't work. So he picks up the phone. He calls his wife. And he says to his wife, honey. And what do you think she did? She passed out. So then, because the radio station knew this judge and every, it got on the radio and everybody thought he was dead, he begins to call a couple of his friends. And they think somebody's playing a prank on him. Finally, he has to call somebody out of town to come pick him up so that he can go back to the house to prove to his wife that he is alive. This is a true story. Sometimes things are hard to believe, aren't they? That's a hard one to believe, but it's a true story. Does anybody know why they used to put the bells in the coffins? Because sometimes they're buried alive. This is a true story. So some things are hard to believe, and so it was in our lesson today. I know. They were gathered in the upper room, and Jesus all of a sudden is there behind closed doors. And they are amazed because Jesus is standing there with them, and they are startled and frightened. Now, there's a couple of reasons why they would be startled and frightened. Probably the main reason would be they were afraid they were going to be arrested. Because remember what the priests do? They pass this rumor around that his disciples had stolen his body. Right? And so they're afraid that the Romans 
or some of the Sadducees, Pharisees are going to come and grab hold of them and arrest them and take them to the court. So they're, by, they're behind the locked door, and when Jesus shows up, all of a sudden there is fear, doubt, joy, and amazement. That's what's in our scripture today. They were able to see Jesus as their resurrected Savior only after they were able to get through all of that emotion till they could see what truth was. So what we're going to look at today, we're going to look at what does it mean that Jesus rose from the dead? What does it mean to you? Do you have a resurrected relationship with Jesus? Or is it just some historical fact that somebody told you? Do you understand that presence of the Holy Spirit? Is he truly your resurrected Savior and Lord? And does it make a difference in your life? So the scripture begins like this. While they were still talking, and who was talking? Disciples. All right, so let's go back to the scripture. Would you be? <laughs> who was talking? There was three people, or three groups, I should say. The disciples. The what? The two on the road to Emmaus. The women. Don't leave out the women. That's the only reason why they were in the upper room eating fish. Let's be real. And so the women had seen the angels. Mary had seen the angels. So they're all up there and they're talking about this stuff when suddenly something happens and Jesus is in their presence. Now, Luke's gospel does not tell us that they were behind locked doors. So this is where sci-fi comes in. Because Jesus just morphed right through that door. No wonder they were afraid. They didn't understand you could beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligible life here on earth. <laughs> they didn't believe that. They didn't understand that. They had never seen that. Also, he has like a resurrected body. So it's going to be a little different. Jesus realizes their fear, and the very first words out of his mouth are what? Peace be with you, which is a Hebrew blessing. It means shalom. Shalom is different than just peace or no land with any war. Shalom means something uh, fuller. It doesn't just mean, hi guys, how you doing? Some people think that's what it means. Are things, you got to enter peace. Is things going good? In the West, peace is that conflict, you know, that, that absence of conflict from war. But in Hebrew, it means something that is holistic. You never live in a world just by yourself. You're always living in a community. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and body, strength. So when he says, shalom, peace be with you, he's talking about heart, mind, soul, and flesh. So when I say peace, am I just talking about your outer circumstances? You can have health, and yet your family's in one hot mess. So do you have peace? You can have a family that's harmonious and you're sick as a dog. Do you have peace? Not according to the Hebrews. So you have to have mind, heart, body, and soul, complete peace. So when he comes in, listen to me. This is a really biggie. When he says shalom, what is he saying? They're in the midst of fear. They're in the midst of grief. And what does this resurrection mean to them? Ha. Ah. So when he says shalom, he's saying, look, it's done. No longer do your sins count for anything. You are set free. Does that make sense? Shalom is a big word here. It means different after his resurrection than it meant before. It was a place where they knew they had been set free, where no longer were they in bondage, and they're stunned as Jesus smiles and says, shalom lakim. Peace to you. Wholeness to you. No longer do you need to have fears and doubts and disbeliefs. And yet, they did not believe. So Jesus says to him, why are you troubled? 
Why are you worrying about stuff? Why are your doubts rising in your mind? Why are you responding this way? Don't you know the power of the resurrection? Don't you have a relationship with the God? Say, who can? Say, who can? He can. We can't, but he can. So he comes in and he steps into that place and he says, Shalom, and they are still scared and they're still struggling. They're in a place of doubt. And he's asking them, why you got doubts? What causes doubts in our mind? Is it lack of faith? What causes doubts in our mind? Is it that Jesus' body was different in the resurrection? What causes doubts in their mind? Can I say lack of belief? Not believing what Jesus had said. Wow. That's why we need to know this. Got it? Not knowing what Jesus has said. Realizing their doubt dilemma, he starts with the body. It's I. I am that I am. Look. Touch. Pinch yourself. Ah. Look, touch. See the flesh and the bones. Jesus wanted to assure him that he was a real physical body in that resurrection. Ain't no hocus pocus. Ain't no alamogocus. Ain't no ghost. Something that was done by the Holy Ghost. But he is real. Even though his resurrected body might have looked a little different than their bodies, Jesus knows that seeing, touching will convince the disciples. So he wants to establish his identity for them to allow them to see that his body was there and it retained the wounds. Now, some people say, now I thought with my resurrected body, I was going to be different. All this fat was going to be gone. <laughs> Jesus still has those nail prints. Ah. Why would he do that? When he was the Lord of all creation, when he creates, he recreates, he, he forms everything whole, makes it right, heals, there is no pain, no suffering in heaven. Think about that just a minute. Why would he do that? Is it possible there was still a lesson to learn? <laughs> Who saw the crucifixion? The disciples. Did they see that nail go into his arm or his hand? Same word, by the way, so we don't really know. Did they see it go in his feet? So when they saw his body, if it did not have those, would they have recognized him? Possible? That might have been the answer. I think it is one of the answers. The other was so that the object of eternal amazement would be seen. The angels say in the tomb, he is not here. He is risen from the dead. He had to be on the cross. I knew I was on his mind. Couldn't have picked a better one, Harriet. He knew me but he still loved me. Third, to be the ornaments of his trophies, of his great work for us. Does anybody know what Isaiah 49, 16 says? Memorize it. Memorize it. We were written on the palms of his hands. What does that mean? Those nail prints were for us. That was our name written on him. Wow. Another reason, I think, was to memorize the weapons with which he defeated death. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Where, O death, is thy victory? Where, O death, is thy? Because <laughs> the victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, I think it was to serve that, to show that he was the advocate 
in that perpetual intercession for us. If he had not died and rose again and sat at the right hand of God the Father, he would not have been the perfect lamb who could intercede for us in all our sin. So it's in that understanding that we begin to so, see that that proved in the resurrection that Jesus was not a ghost, not a phantom, but a real body. It totally disputes docism. Does anybody know what docism is? Docism says that Jesus, his spirit came and inhabited a body. Not that it was born to Mary, get it? So, and when he died, the spirit left. That he was not fully man and fully God. It totally disputes that, doesn't it? Now, why is that important? It's important because for him to be your sacrificial lamb, he had to be the perfect lamb son of God, and he had to be, pinch yourself again, he had to be a man. He had to be flesh. Otherwise, it wouldn't have counted. See? Because he has to go through everything that we go through. So he disputes that, and it's in that understanding that he is inviting them and saying, hey, look, touch me, baby. Can't you see that I am not afraid? You know that song, right? Touch me. Touch me. Let me touch you. In Jesus' appearance, he has flesh and bones, and they still do not believe. Oh, my goodness. How often have we been in Jesus' presence and we don't believe? So there it is. He's in the middle. He then offers the, the eating of bread and in joy and amazement. They still don't get there I said bread it's fish my mom would say fish she didn't like fish I love fish so he took it and he ate it in their presence because it was in that place that there was table fellowship and they had communion together when you open your table offer bread to someone it means that you are one with them okay and so he does that for further proof However, it says that they, because of their joy and amazement, they did not believe. It kept them from faith. So, I mean, it's a normal response. If Jesus came in here and he stood right there and he began saying shalom to you, what would be your response? Would you be a little bit shocked? A little bit afraid? Oh, no, he's omniscient. He knows what, I, what I've done. <laughs> right? And so I, I kind of understand their reaction, but I also see what Jesus did. It was his love that responds in a way that is persistent with his nature as he begins to nurture them and unpack things. Because he sees their fear. He sees their anxiousness. He sees that they're struggling. So what does this say about us? What blocks us from having that resurrection reality relationship with Jesus? Well, let's take a look at that. The first thing we see is fear. Fear can get in the way of your faith. If you're anxious about stuff and you're fearful of what's going to happen, it means that you probably are struggling with your belief and your faith in Jesus. Because he's not the one who can. He's not even the one who is, Urban. He is nothing if you fear. If you fear, he is nothing because you don't trust him. You don't believe in him. Okay? So the fear was the problem was they, you know, they were struggling with that. People live in fear. Uh, Ann Landers was uh, received about 1,000 or 10,000 letters, it says. Actually, I thought it was only 1,000, but it's 10,000 letters each month. And they ask her, was there some predominant theme in these letters. And she said, oh, I get letters about everything, but really they're all around one problem. And that problem seems to be fear. Fear of people losing their health. What do we fear? <laughs> people fearing because they're afraid they're going to lose a loved one. What do we fear? Fearing because we're afraid of losing our money. 
in the market today, oh my gosh. She said, what I see is people are afraid of life itself. What's going to happen in life? Fear can keep you from faith. It can keep people from the very thing in life that offers assurance and hope and freedom. And because of our fear, we are kept from God. Sometimes we're even afraid of God. What God will do in my life, what God will demand from me in my life if I answer yes. What will happen with other people? How will they react if I start talking about Jesus? So we don't witness. So fear can make things hard to believe and keep us from going to that deeper level. The second thing that keeps us from having that resurrected relationship with Jesus is amazement and joy. Anybody got a question mark? <laughs> I see the question mark. I see the faces. They're puzzling. Christianity for some people appears to be too good. Ah, two reasons for that. First, how could God's love and acceptance be unconditional when I know that nothing is for what? Free. So that's why we see a lot of people trying to earn their salvation. There's a difference between being saved and working out your salvation and working for your salvation. Got it? So that can block us because we don't think that we're good enough, that's number two, to receive this. So some people work it out and some people say, I'm not good enough to accept Jesus. Well, guess what? I'm going to say you're not. Look at yourself and say, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of his grace. But his grace is my grace. Amen. Amen. So sometimes they feel bad about themselves. Sometimes they think it's too good to be true. So they struggle with that believing and it blocks their faith. So what blocks you from fully believing? Is today the day you need a Jesus encounter? Do you need him to show up so you can touch him? Do you need to see your name written in the palms of his hands? Jesus then realizing that they're still not getting it <laughs> reminds them that he told them what was going to happen and he told them about Moses, the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms and he told them that he was going to die, be buried and raised again in three days. When I went to preaching school, they said, this is how you preach a sermon. You tell them what you're going to tell them. I already told you what I was going to tell you. You tell them. You make sure they listen. That's why we do that reactive stuff. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you what I told you. Why do you think that is? I'm telling you how many times? On the third day... Get it? Any time in the scripture where you see that three, something good's happening. Hopefully it's happening in you. Amen. Resurrection. So he tells them what he told them. He tells them again so that they can get it. You see, we didn't make that up. God did. And it all started in the beginning. <laughs> in the very beginning. So... They still didn't get it, so he takes out the scriptures, and he begins, remember, we're not going to do the whole sermon. <laughs> he tells them what, from the very beginning in Genesis, that he was the seed, he was the one that would bruise the serpent's heel, goes through the whole thing. I did do a printout for that. We'd probably be here for about three hours. I'd be a good Wesleyan if I unpacked it all, but I'm not going to do that for you today. Go get the printout. Dave got the printout, and he went, oh, my goodness. You need to get the printout. You need to look at it. It needs to be your Bible study for the day. 
All right, so he unpacks the whole thing, shows that on the third day that Messiah rose from the dead, he talked to them and unpacked it like he did with the two on the road to the Emmaus. And all of a sudden, the McFly moment popped open, and they said, oh, my gosh. He told them what he was going to tell them. He showed them that it did happen, and then he told them again. You know, that's something that's so awesome about the scriptures. You see, because this is truth, if Jesus says it, we know it's going to happen. Think about that a minute. Never in this scripture, never in Luke, does Jesus say one thing and do something else. Wow. That means it's truth. And the truth will do what? Set you free, baby. Yeah. Amen. Never forget how earnestly the Lord always went back to the scriptures. His very first temptations were all rebuted with the word of God. And in the end, what do we see Jesus doing? Yeah. The word made flesh, sharing the word of God. So, we're at the end and Jesus wanted them to understand a couple of things. One, that the cross was not something that man put on him, but that he embraced the cross. He took up the cross. Why? Because it was God's redemptive plan for man that he would die on the cross, be crucified, and rise again. It was prophesied. It was fulfilled. It is. He also wanted them to know the message of repentance and remission of sins. He says, Shalom, your sins have been paid for. What does he say to the woman that was caught in adultery? Go and hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. So he knows that we need to repent and we need the remission of sins. And then that would be brought into the world because there is nothing more greater Nothing betterer, nothing more special than somebody who's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And then he does something special. He says, I'm going to send what my Father has promised. He never did anything apart from the Lord, God, his Father. Stay in the city until you've been clothed with power. Power on high. So they're called not only to witness what has happened, but they're called to understand that resurrection reality and relationship calls them to go witness and spread the good news. This is the work that any redeemed person is responsible for. So are you redeemed? Are you doing it in God's power? They were to preach the gospel in Jesus' name. They were to preach the gospel under his orders. They were to preach the gospel under his authorities. They were to preach it knowing repentance and remission of sins comes by the virtue of whose name? His name. They were to preach it to all the world in the power of their own. Who thinks that right? Who says no? Nope. Whose power? Jesus' power, power of the Holy Spirit. I think that might be what's wrong with our church today. I think sometimes people are doing it in their own power. Ouch. I forgot to tell you to tuck your toes on that one. So Luke begins by, his whole gospel begins with the Holy Spirit. Where's the first place we see the Holy Spirit showing up? Hmm? No. Say where? Where? Genesis 1, he was over the water. But where in Luke's gospel do we see it showing up? Mary, did you know? I have to give you the hints, even. The virgin birth. Thank you. Hallelujah. Somebody got it. You have, have revelation reality going on there. I love it. What's the second place we see the Holy Spirit showing up in Luke's gospel? Who said Jesus' baptism? Good job, Vernon. 
Well, you were in the first service. That did not count. At least you learned the first service. We see it here again, right, in the second birth of these. And we're going to continue to see that Jesus is alive. And in some of the other ones that we're going to look at, he breathes on them. That word is ruach. Say that with me. That's, that's Hebrew. Greek is newfish. Say newfish. Not, not a new fish. Newfish. And it is the breath of God going into you. It is the Holy Spirit residing in you. So that's when we see it. And they are to carry this message of mercy and salvation out into the whole world. So you got it, right? Things block our fear. Jesus shows up. He tells them what he told them. I told you what we needed to know. And now I'm going to tell you what you just learned. Take notes. You ready? We see God. We see God in his great mercy scooping down to us in our need so that we might see that we're not alone and we don't need to be afraid. We see God. We see God in his mercy speak to us through his word and through the Holy Spirit as he invites us to come in our brokenness so that we might be whole. We see God speaking to us in his mercy as he delights to sit, sit, come down and meet our needs so we might be reconciled. We might be reconciled to him. We can turn away from our unbelief and run to God and then we can become who he has called us to be and we can fulfill that purpose in God. And finally, we see God coming down in his great mercy as he shows us that he is the one. He is the one who gives us hope. He is the one who gives us salvation. And he is the only way to life. Beloved, we need a dusk dawning. We need to wake up. We need to get a cataract operation. We need God to open our eyes so we can see, so we can have that resurrection relationship with Jesus, not just what was, but what is, so that it always will be. And we need that in the name of Jesus. And all the people say, amen. Today, I do have a couple of prayers for you. We're going to pray for those who may not know Jesus that way, that they'll come a little closer. But I want to let you know that we have... a. A couple of issues that are going on. Um, Laurie lost her mama. Sorry, Laurie. I had to share it. And we're going to have a service here on Saturday. And so please be praying for Laurie and Brad and for the family. Um, And if you're available on Saturday, uh, 1 o'clock was the visitation. 2 o'clock is the service. Please plan on coming out and supporting her. The second is that Sylvia is struggling. They've called in hospice. Um, there's some family dynamics going on, Lord in your mercy. Uh, it always happens when I, I've, I've seen things, struggles with people when they're losing their mama they, or their daddy, they really struggle. They struggle in so many ways. So please be praying for her as God comforts her, brings her peace, and brings peace to the family. There might be other things that you know about. It's good to have Betty back in the house. She, her her, uh, her minister, uh, her Surgery went well, and so we're, we just keep praying for her healing. And I don't know what else is on the table, so we're going to go to God. We're going to pray. I'll start out. You can then lift up concerns, and then we're going to close out, and we're going to sing. Sound good? Okay. Father God, we just come to you today, and we thank you, Jesus, that we can boldly come before the throne and that you intercede for us. Help us today as we are intercessors of your grace. Be with those who are struggling with their health issues. Father, I pray for hearts. I pray for physical health. I pray for families. I pray that you would be with friends and neighbors. And I pray this all in the holy name of Jesus. I ask, Lord, now that you would be with us as we lift up those names that need your grace.
Father, we pray for upcoming operations today. You know, there's a couple of procedures happening this week. We pray, Father, for your presence in the midst of this new pastoral move, that you would be with Reverend O as he leaves that church and they greet, and that you'd be with me as I grieve for my husband and this church. Father, we pray for revival, which reminds me there's a, a new men's study. You want to look at that. We pray for revival for this church. And we ask, Lord, for your presence among us. And Father, we do pray that you would bring forth your healing in this community. Because we know that it's only with Christ and Christ alone that there is going to be what needs to happen. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our closing song is Because He Loves. Would you please stand? Because He Lives. He loves to.
live in Christ, knowing he blesses you, embraces you, and fills you. It's in his holy name we go forth. And all the people say, Amen. Amen.